Yes, sir, what's your name? Hello, my name is Carter. Hey, Carter. And I'd very much like to begin by addressing your offensive moral law argument that without God as an objective moral standard, we atheists, those who do not have the influence of theism, would be Hitler-esque immoral beings. Okay, let me stop right there because that's not the case. I never said that atheists can't be moral. I never said atheists don't know morality. In fact, atheists know morality just like everybody else. We know morality because it's written on our hearts. What I'm saying is, is that atheists can't justify morality. That's the point. In fact, I had to say this several times to Christopher Hitchens. Christopher, I'm not saying you're a bad guy. Christopher, I'm not saying you don't know morality. In fact, I like Christopher. I thought he was a good guy. What I'm saying is you can't justify why not murder innocent people to get what you want? That's the point. It's a point about ontology, not a point about epistemology. It's not a point about how you know the moral law. It's a point about why does the moral law exist? I may return to address this, sort of the gentleman behind me may address it, but I'd really like to address your design argument. Okay. As I understood that you've argued that a painting or a creation, to use the term painting, implies a painting or a design implies a designer. But I must ask, who designed God? And if no one designed God, if God is timeless, spaceless, and immaterial, and he existed eternally in an uncaused fashion, then why can't nature exist in the exact same way, in an eternal, uncaused, spaceless, timeless, immaterial fashion? Why can't our uncaused origins be as marvelous and precise as God, but be natural causes? Excellent question, Carter. That's a very good question. You're right that we have two options here. Either the universe is the uncaused first cause or something beyond the universe is the uncaused first cause. The problem is, is that all the evidence points to the fact that the universe is not the uncaused first cause. And I didn't have time to go through that evidence tonight. That was part one. But I'll, I'll give it to you very briefly in an acronym, SURGE, S-U-R-G-E. S stands for the second law of thermodynamics which says that the universe is running down. Well, if it's running down, somebody must have wound it up. We'd have no energy left right now if the universe was eternal. The U stands for the fact that the universe is expanding. Edwin Hubble d detected that back in 1929 and shows that everything came from a single point, a point actually of infinite density, the singularity, which is actually nothing. So the universe had a beginning. The R in surge stands for the radiation afterglow. That's the remnant heat discovered by Penzias and Wilson in 1965, which is literally the smoking gun to the Big Bang. There's heat, remnant heat from the Big Bang still out there, which shows that the universe had a beginning. The G in surge stands for the great galaxy seeds, which were very fine temperature variations in that radiation afterglow that allowed the galaxies to form in the early universe. And the E stands for Einstein's theory of general relativity, which shows that time, space, and matter are co-relative, that they came into existence together, that space, time, and matter literally had a beginning. Einstein knew this in 1916. Then observational evidence began in 1919 when Eddington did his test on the, on the uh, eclipse. And then Hubble discovered the expanding universe in 1929. And then on to the radiation afterglow and the great galaxy seeds after that. So, the evidence points to the fact that the universe is not the uncaused first cause. So there must be something beyond the universe that is, and that thing that's beyond the universe must be spaceless, timeless, and immaterial. And if you're timeless, do you have a beginning? No. No. So that God is not, he didn't have a beginning. He's the uncaused first cause. And look, Aristotle, Plato, they all knew this. They knew there had to be an unmoved mover. Um, I believe that you're drawing a false dichotomy because we do not know that the original cause was God. There is no reason to say that an intelligent designer was the first cause, the uncaused first cause that caused everything else. I do not have the training or expertise to refute search science, and in fact I accept your conclusion that the Big Bang had a beginning and space, time, and matter came into existence from a point of origin. But we do not know that this point of origin is God. Calling it God is to make a false assumption. Another reason for the existence of everything might simply be that other dimensions had the power for, and the marvelousness and complexity to create a situation where existence could, where the Big Bang could be brought into existence and space, time, and matter could begin to exist without an intelligent designer having a hand. Well, Carter, what you just described there is what we would call God. God is in another dimension that has the ability to bring these dimensions into existence. So if you want to call it another dimension, you can call it that. But that's exactly what we mean by God. 
But then why is there a theology? Why do we worship God? He could easily be called another. Excellent point. You don't have to worship God. In fact, Aristotle never worshiped God. In fact, the Greeks never got their theology and philosophy together. They knew that there had to be an unmoved mover, but they never put the two together and worshiped the unmoved mover. So you don't have to worship the unmoved mover. You don't have to. You can do whatever you want. That's why you have free will. God loves you enough to give you free will. You can love him or reject him. That's up to you. <laughs> but on that point, you do have the free will to accept or reject God. But the obvious conclusion is that rejection of God will lead to eternal damnation in hell. So in reality, we do not really have the choice to accept or not to accept God. We must ultimately accept God, assuming we choose to avoid perdition. Well, if you want to avoid, well, let me back up for a second. There's only two possibilities if God exists. In eternity, you're going to be with him or you're not going to be with him, right? That's logically the only two options. If you want to be with him, you will seek him out and be with him. If you don't want to be with him, God will not force you into his presence against your will. In fact, let me make the objection stronger than what you're making it. You're very polite, but I debated an atheist who was a little bit more direct. And, and let me uh, tell you, this man was, a, he's a good man. I like him. His name is Eddie Tabash. He's an attorney from Beverly Hills. We debated at the University of Michigan a number of months ago. And he looked at me during the Q&A and he said, Frank, my mother was a survivor of the Holocaust. She lived an awful life. Somebody presented her with the gospel and she rejected it. Is she in hell right now? I said, Eddie, I don't know where your mother is. I don't know if she made a profession of faith in her last moments. But if she didn't, then God will not force her into his presence against her will. God is too loving for that. And I asked the audience this question. In fact, I'll ask you as an audience this question. Ladies, is there anybody in here who's ever had a man pursue you and you did not want that man to pursue you? You did not want to date him? Anyone in here? Of course. In fact, some of you are going, yeah, he's sitting right next to me right now. He won't leave me alone. <laughs> I said, OK, ladies, suppose this man continues to pursue you and continues to pursue you. And you say, look, I only like you as a friend. Ladies, why don't you just take the knife, stick it in, and turn it? Because every man in here has heard this. I like you, but only as a friend. Well, suppose he continues to pursue you, continues to pursue you. And he gets to the point where he says, look, I love you so much, I'm going to force you to love me. Can he do that? No, he can't do that. Love, by definition, must be freely given. So if he truly did love you, what would he do? He would leave you alone. That's exactly what God does. He keeps sending us cards, letters, and flowers while we're here. And if we keep rejecting him, keep rejecting him, he gives us up to our own desires. And that ultimately what, hell is, ultimately what hell is. Hell is separation from God. So you're free in hell. You can continue to reject God in hell, but you're confined to hell. In fact, hell is a quarantine of evil. That's what it is. And heaven, of course, is being in the very presence of God. God loves you too much to force you into his presence against your will. Thanks, Carter.